All right, so here we go again, Ashley. And February is such a short month that the webinar seems to roll around really quickly this time. It now, have. Yeah. Before we get started, is there any news or anything that you wanted to share with us today? Yeah, look, there's certainly nothing new from the insolvency space in terms of um, uh, new legislation and stuff like that. Finally, we've got a bit of stability in the legislation, but I, I think from, uh, from the insolvency side of the world, obviously ProBuild uh, ProBuild's insolvency uh, has certainly uh, thrown some uh, talk around, and um, I think we're going to see some fairly big impacts of that. But we'll we'll talk through today around some of the uh, the reasons why we think those impacts are there. But I think that's probably the most significant thing that we've seen happen this month, mm -hmm. uh, and it's probably the start of um, a lot more pain to come. Interestingly, yeah. we spoke about supply chain issues in the construction industry at our last webinar. And uh, here we are at the next one, and uh, there's already been a major development in that area. We're so prophetic, aren't we? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the other thing is, uh, Lisa's just popped up. Uh, if anyone through the course of today has any questions on anything that we're talking about, uh, please feel free to type them into the chat box. We'll try and uh, pick them up in our conversation as we go along. Uh, you also have the ability to uh, put your hand up um, I won't see that, but Elise will tell me uh, and let me know if there's someone who's got their hand up and then we can unmute you and uh, let you talk as your way through. Happy to be a bit flexible with these things as we go. Otherwise, there will be time at the end for everyone to have a bit of a chat and ask any questions they have. Okay. All right, Ash, thanks for that. Now, today we're going to talk about insolvency trends and forecasts. And specifically, we're going to look at the position of the ATO and, and other creditors and what that might mean for business owners out there. Uh, at the end of the webinar, we're going to just talk through a very quick real life case study of a De Ongari client who faced some of these issues. Mm -hmm. So Ash, let's get into it. The Corporations Amendment Corporate Insolvency Reform Act of 2020 came in on the 1st of January, 2021. Yep. Now that was described as the biggest change in insolvency laws in 30 years. And it introduced processes for debt restructuring for small businesses and for simplified liquidations. Um, the idea was, or the, the feeling was, that small businesses were not engaging with the insolvency industry because of some of the costs involved in certain types of strategies. And this was felt to, uh, as a way of reducing the costs and simplifying the process to encourage uh, people to engage with the insolvency industry. Yep. What's the experience with these reforms been so far? Yeah, so it, interestingly, with the reforms, it's what nearly you know, 12 or 14 months now. Um, in, in a, specifically talking about the debt restructure more than the simplified liquidation, uh, because that's just really, in theory, a cheaper version of the liquidation. Um, it hasn't proved to be that much cheaper, I think. So, uh, but we'll, we'll leave that one aside. But on the debt restructure side, there's been 33. Uh, debt restructures that have gone through in that 12, 14 month period. There was an expectation that there was going to be an avalanche of those come through. And for those who don't like the legislation, they were using that as an excuse that it's a bad legislation should not have been used. The reality was, is though, that um, it there hasn't been a lot because there's still, you know, last year was a year where we all thought that things would go back to normal mm -hmm. and it didn't. Mm -hmm. um, you know, with the ongoing COVID issues and, and there was a lot more generosity with creditors, with the ATO and with the further lockdowns that occurred last year, um, the, the, the world didn't, or Australia didn't go back to what it thought it was meant to do uh, back in 2021. So I think we'll start to see a pickup of that legislation and the use of it this year more than we did last. But of those 33, 27 of them did get accepted, right? which, which is um, really quite encouraging because the reality is most of these, these type of, um, any type of insolvency generally always has the ATO involved. Mm. So there's a fair chance that the ATO have been rather supportive of those. Yes, yeah, so I've heard um, stories that the ATO have been voting in favour of it. Have you heard the yeah. same thing? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I, I think um, there, there's certainly some that I know specifically that they have, not just the rumour of it, and there's others that you would assume that they have just on the style of it. So I, I think that legislation is actually going to be a very useful tool for small business 
Um, you know, there are limits on it, that you maximum debts of a million dollars and things like that. Yep. So it is only designed for the smaller micro market. But I think it's a really powerful legislation um, and a very good option for plan Bs for some people. So when you look at it, Ashley, the issue may not have been so much the, the costs involved in some of these um, insolvency matters, but rather it's the lack of pressure that, that directors are feeling. Oh, I think absolutely. Yeah, I think if you look at uh, insolvencies have been way down, and which we've talked about uh, in past presentations, and and it's really all over the press. Mm. But we went from you know, if you take two thousand and eighteen, well uh, pre COVID, there was roughly about ten thousand external administrations uh, back then, and in two thousand and twenty one, it was we only had six thousand. So that's a, a ten fair drop. six. Yeah. So. You know, a forty percent drop when you consider that we've had the most harsh financial environments for the last, you know, couple of years, uh, shows that there is a lot sitting out there that just haven't been dealt with. Mm. So why are the numbers down so much? That's a massive drop in external administrations. What's driving that? Yeah, well, uh, again, most of it's pretty obvious. Is you've got the government relief packages. Um, the uh, state relief packages, there's been some ph phenomenal money thrown out by the state governments on top of all the stuff that's happened federally. Um, you know, in 2020, there was a mon monitorium effective or made it almost impossible to chase anyone for a debt. Mm. Uh, it wasn't a monitorium as such, but it was made so hard that you're better off not bothering. Um, but on top of that, and um, it is just purely the, the business community has all supported each other. Mm. Like, you know, <laughs> I, I can get a little bit proud about being Australian sometimes, and I think really for the last two years, Australia has really stood strong with each other and supported each other. And, you know, if you couldn't pay your bill because you got caught in COVID, people were doing their best to try and hold off and chasing you and, and trying to work with you. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's just been a complete lack of pressure. Now, unfortunately, that's going to lead to a lot of problems moving forward, uh, but, but without that pressure... There's no need for people to be forced into liquidation or to go and seek advice as to whether that's the right thing to do. So, Ash, that can't go on forever. I know Aussies are great people and they're very supportive <laughs> of each other, but at the end of the day, a lot of these creditors out there, they're, they're owed money and they're running their own businesses. You know, yeah. they've, got, they've got their own problems and their own rent to pay and their own ATO debts. Uh, any signs that the pressure is going to be coming? Uh, well, yeah, well, absolutely. I think the court, the court listings have already started to be quite an uptick in people starting to go to court to try and push people to pay them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that fell away, uh, obviously, very heavily in COVID. I think, again, using the 2018 year, there was 23,000 court actions. Uh, in 2021, that went down to 14,000. Wow. Um, but in January alone, there was a 46% increase from January of 2021. Okay. So a 50% increase in court action uh, or around about 50%. So there is a real, um, yeah, cl a clear picture that people have gone, my patience is over, it's time to pay. Mm. And, um, and some people are just not going to have that money. So it's, it's forcing people into taking court action to try and achieve some results. And I've noticed in some of those court listings, Ashley, that some people that were quiet during COVID, their names are starting to appear. And I'm talking there predominantly about smaller business lenders yep. and fintech lenders that obviously yes. they've yes. reached the point that they're looking to recover some money. Now, the ATO yes. aren't showing up there, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Yep. What I think we're also seeing with a lot of banks, uh, major banks have been very understanding. They've been granting hardship or other concessions or variations of contracts to their borrowers. But they're now starting to look a bit closer at their risk exposures as well. So yeah, I think they're certainly picking up. And the other big one that we are seeing in the court list is just the, the private creditors. So yeah. you talk about everyone trying to support each other. Well, that patience, I think, has run out. And yeah. so although the big institutions, as you mentioned, the ATO, state revenues... Um, you know, the banks, they're still trying to work with people mm. as the, at the really top end of town, that medium and smaller end creditor. Um, 
just doesn't have the uh, probably the cash backing to not chase anymore. Uh, so there is a lot of pressure on that starting to come through. Now, normally I like grilling you and giving you a hard time, but I'm, I'm going to ask you a softball question here and help you out a little bit. Right. If we assume that the pressure is coming, right, at some point it's got to. If you look at the, the decline in court actions, the decline in external administrations and the indications that that's now starting to ramp up, it really is just a matter of time. So the question is actually, what should business owners that may have a few financial issues or a few concerns, what they should what should they be doing with that time? Well, <laughs> I'm going to use one of my old uh, sayings that anyone who's been listening to us for the last 18 months will know is, and that is to get their plan B in place. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's imperative that people, if they know that there's, or if they think there's a risk of potential issue in the future, now's the time to be looking at a plan to try and work out how to manage through that. Yep. It has to be done. You know, it's, yeah, it's just got to start looking at these things now and don't leave it to the last minute. I've got to say, in the time that I've worked at the Yong Reed, I've never seen someone criticised for telling their client to get advice too early. No. Or too soon. But no, I that's right. Yeah. All right, let's talk a little bit about the ATO. Um, always a, an interesting topic. Uh, what do we know about the position with the ATO now? What have they been saying, Ash? Yeah, and look, again, we, we, we're talking, Phil, to people who probably deal with the ATO more regularly than us. Yeah. Um, but what, what we do know is that the ATO's debt book has been, they're saying, is now up around the $53 billion mark. Um, so that, that's a lot of coin out there that they, uh, they need to collect. Um, the ATO has still been uh, particularly generous and, um, and wanting to engage and talk with people more than start any court action. I think if I'm a cynical voter, um, I'm pretty confident that we're not going to see the ATO's name in any court list prior to the election. I'd be surprised. Um, <laughs> uh, but that doesn't mean that they can't start putting a bit of pressure on. So I think, as we mentioned last month, starting to put pressure on and going through a legal process is probably going to take three to four months anyway, so you're not going to see, it's fair chance you're going to miss any election dates now anyway. Um, but and, and they're still being quite generous with payment plans. Mm. Although, again, I'm seeing a little bit of typing of that with some of the calls that we've had. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, if you're putting together reasonable um, offers, they seem, still seem to be taking those. Okay. Mm. So what have the ATOs said about their focus for the coming months? Where do they expect to be spending their time or what sort of things are they likely to be doing? Yeah, from, from our point of view, and, and obviously the ATO puts out a whole lot of agendas on what they're focusing on. Uh, I saw something the other day that they're going to keep a close eye on uh, on the work from home expenses and work expenses, uh, given that everyone's been home for a while. Um, but that's that's outside what we're, where our focus is. They, they seem to be primarily focused um, on, and what they've told is that getting uh, lodgerants up to date Mm -hmm. So, um, and again, there'll be plenty on this call, on this uh, on this webinar today, that would already be getting those calls. Um, that, that, that there is a a, um, a push to get everyone up to date. So, if they know what they've got to collect, they want the returns in, so they know what they can uh, go and chase. Yeah. The other big one is unpaid super. There's a real pressure on unpaid super, and if you're not engaging with them, then we're seeing a lot of audit activity in that area. Um, a little bit, um, they're, they're chasing that medium-sized debt. At, at the moment, we're actually seeing that they're leaving the really big debts alone, mm. um, which is weird, but they're chasing that, putting a little bit more pressure on the smaller debts, um, assuming that they can pay that, they just haven't bothered to get around to it. Um, and and they're, they're, they're certainly on the phones talking now. Mm. Uh, we had a client yesterday, actually, that... Uh, uh, received a call from the ATO, thought it was a scam, gave them half a mouthful, um, thinking it was a scam artist. The ATO then rang the accountant and said, look, I think the client thinks that you know, it was a fake call. <laughs> and the, the client was mortified when uh, the accountant rang and said, no, that wasn't a fake it call. It was the ATO. So, <laughs> <laughs> so they're certainly getting on the phones. Yeah, and I think uh, publicly the ATO have said that they're going to chase those larger debts. 
but that's not necessarily the experience that we're having right now. They're tending no. to aim at some quite modest sized debts and those sort of middle middle of the road or middle range type of debts. That's correct. So, yeah. so as you said that one of the main focuses of the ATO is to engage with taxpayers, you know? Yes. What do they mean when they say they want to engage? What are they really talking about? Uh, yeah, well, I think it just means that they want the taxpayer or through their accountant to be talking to them about how they're going to pay their outstanding debt if they have any, mm -hmm. what they're doing about getting their lodgements up to date. So like anything, if you communicate with someone, they're going to be more likely to work with you. And if you don't communicate with them, then there's, they, they start thinking the worst and may go down other paths. So it's about talking to them. Um, it's about trying to give them offers where you can or why you can't. You know, I've got a, a um, again, another client came into us for a plan B, but we don't actually need to enact anything for probably six to nine months because the ATO is a, uh, a client that brings in a lot of stuff from China He's got a lot of supply chain issues and he's been smashed by employees. So the ATO has actually given him a grace period of nearly six months and just said, just go and get yourself sorted and then come back and then we'll work it out then. So where you're telling them the story and giving them the whole picture, they do seem to be being quite uh, willing to work with people at the moment. I'll just chuck in an example there for a client that I've been working with. And there are four directors in this company. It's a family business. And each of the directors got a director's penalty notice for over $2 million about two years ago, or just before COVID, about two and a half years ago. And that's just the director's penalty notice amount for PAYG and super. That's not the entire tax debt. Yeah. And uh, they've recently, within the last couple of months, entered into a payment plan with the ATO. And the ATO were happy to give them a payment plan, mm. uh, but they insisted that all the payments be paid off the superannuation first. Yeah, that was a, a definite requirement of theirs. Yeah, yeah they no, think that, certainly... that amount of money that's been owed for that amount of time, and they still agree to a payment plan. Yeah, they're, they're certainly being generous on that. But if you're not talking, we're seeing a lot of audits being done. Right. And and interestingly, we're seeing a little bit of interagency stuff happening. So, um, uh, workplace, yeah, you know, some of the workplace, the safe workplaces are doing various audits and finding that there's super issues. Right. And then reporting that to the ATO, fair work, that sort of thing. So a lot of interagency stuff going on at the moment that's creating issues as well. Okay. So the ATO wants taxpayers to go into a payment plan. Mm. Um, the payment plan that the client I mentioned entered into was for a six-month duration. So we'll, we'll do these payments for six months, we'll pay it off the super, then we'll sit down and talk about it and we'll, we'll do something else. Yep. What have you seen as being some of the common issues when uh, agreeing to payment plans with the ATO? Yeah, well, uh, there's, a, there's a couple of things that can come up. And we talked, again, in previous um, webinars, we talked about it, is, you know, that, um, again, you get to the end of the six months, what's the plan then? Um, you know, if, you, if you're giving too much information away, then they can use that information against them with garnishee notices, um, you know, and, and different things like that, uh, which I think we're going to talk in a little bit more detail yeah. shortly on. Uh, but the, the other thing is, is that, you know, you, you, you're buying yourself for six months and then we're seeing a lot of people putting their head back in the sand going, I don't need to worry about that for a while and not thinking about what does it look like in four or five months' time. So um, it's a buy time process, which is good. Mm -hmm. But if you're not actually doing something with that time, then it's less effective. Mm. And I suppose a lot of businesses still struggling under COVID. Uh, when those plans come up for renegotiation, it might be tough for them to, to keep going. Yeah, and well, look, you know, you've got the combination of COVID and probably more importantly, the impacts into the supply chain and staffing, um, you know, and the great resignation that we talked about oh. last month. Uh, that's actually having a lot more impact in a lot of businesses than uh uh, than even I'd predicted, you know, a month or two ago. So um, yeah. Yeah, that's that's having some significant impact. And I, I saw uh, through Credit Watch um, or Credit uh, Credit Watcher. Yeah, it's uh, Credit Watch. Yeah, yeah they, they're seeing receivables have dropped by twenty five percent. So no one, you can't, no one's been able to get out of enough billing uh, to keep their normal flow. So that's going to have some serious impacts coming through as well. So, Ash, what's the ATO likely to do if a taxpayer doesn't engage with you? 
Um, okay, so uh, again, the same, we've, we've talked about this before. If they're not engaging, then they need to start doing some other things. Mm. You know, and whether that be, um, whether that be that they go into audit phase, and we, you know, in the last six months, I've seen audits of Division 7 a loans, superannuation, mm. and GST audits as well. So they're using the audit to get in there and try and find out what's going on yep. and to push things through. Um, they're able to uh, deem off the back of that um, uh, so their, their debt that's associated with business. So if you're not engaging, you haven't been reporting, they'll start deeming what you owe mm. so that they know what they're chasing. So, 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 mate, let's say I'm a bad boy, right? I'm a bad boy and I dodge the ATO's phone calls and I ignore their letters and I won't engage with their review process. What might they do? What might the next step for them be? Uh, well, what, we, what we're starting to see a little bit of and what we expect to see is that if they know the debt, so if you have been reporting but you're not talking to them, um, then you know, they're likely to issue direct penalty notices. Um, and uh, and to, to, because what they want to do is they want to try and push someone to call. Mm. And one of the best ways to do it is to turn a, a business debt into a private debt. It'd so, certainly get my attention. If I'm going to direct this penalty notice, it'd, it'd wake me up. Yeah, so if you get those issued, um, they'll, they'll use that as a tool to try and force people to pay. And as we know, with direct penalty notices, if you don't pay it within the 21 days um, and or you don't put it into liquidation or administration within that time, then the director is personally liable for that debt. Mm. And again, that's something that they're looking for because then it's the director putting it into administration or liquidation and not them, which okay. is keeping them out of the court lists. Mm. So I think that that'll be one of their bigger tools that they'll use at the moment, um, as well as, you know, and that can be either the lockdown version or the non-lockdown versions. Well, that doesn't sound good for me, but let's say I'm a, a really naughty boy, right? <laughs> so maybe I not only haven't I engaged with them, but I haven't lodged anything. So I haven't reported or I've not paid my superannuation. Mm -hmm. Or maybe there's already somebody at the ATO that's heard my name before that uh, we've got some bit of a track record with them. <laughs> uh, what's something really nasty that the ATO can do to a taxpayer that just wants to be a bad boy like me? Yeah, well, we're, one of the things that we've seen is, uh, and we, I've mentioned this before, is garnishee notices. Um, you know, they're a cracking way of getting someone's attention because you put a freeze on their bank account. Um, now, uh, this, they, if you're not talking to them and you're a really bad boy, it can be a little bit tricky for them to find the bank account. Yep. Uh, but they do have access to a lot more records than they used to. We all know now <clears throat> that the banks can fill in all the interest details into people's tax returns. So the ATO does get access to those accounts. Yep. And they can issue garnishee notices directly on that. Mm. Now, that, that can be on the bank account. That can be on the debtor, on the uh, on the the um, FPOS facilities. Uh, it can be on um, if they've got some information somewhere, even if you're not talking about your debtors, they can issue on your debtors and tell the debtors to pay uh, pay the ATO rather than pay you. Mm. But you're going to start the business very very quickly uh, with garnishee notices, Absolutely. and we've and we've seen quite a few of those in the last couple of months. Mm. Now the the ATO's use of garnishee notices is somewhat controversial uh, because, as you say, it can just have an immediate and devastating impact on a business. Yep. And they have come under criticism for using uh, these garnishee notices in the past, yep. but it does remain a tool that's available to them that we often see used in more extreme circumstances or more yep. extreme scenarios. Yep. Now, Ash, tell us the story about our friend at the ATO that uh, garnishee that... Uh, <laughs> That yes. entertainer. I won't mention his name, although I'm sure, I mean, he's, most, most accounts would have heard of him before, but yeah. he tells a story about the Garner Seeds where it was a, one of Australia's famous singers who had decided uh, wasn't a particularly good payer of tax. Mm. And, uh, and as a young fella, he decided that he really wanted to make sure he did the right thing by the Australian public and get all the tax he should. He's very so, committed. <laughs> he's a very committed human. But he, uh, he started, um, uh, found out his tour list of his next lot of concerts. This is going back a few years, so it's not a current one, but 
He went back a few years, went to the concerts, but what he'd do is he'd turn up to the venue of the concert every night and then issue the garnishee notice on the venue uh, so that they had to pay him at the every night. But he never did it until he actually started singing yeah. because he wanted to make sure that uh, he, he at least did the work for the public uh, before before he then controlled the money coming out of it. So, and apparently he spent a week on the road just uh, running half an hour behind the other guy until they really realised that he was actually chasing him and then they, uh, then he, then they did a deal after that. Yeah. He's so they used it purely for attention to get them to talk. He's very proud of that. He is. So the ATA could do, like, they're going to send me, they're going to ring my accountant, they're going to send me warning letters, they might do a mini review or an audit, um, could even be done by another government department or, or statutory body. Yep. Um, they could send me a director's penalty notice to get my attention. Or if I'm really bad, they might send me a garnishee notice. Yep. When they get through all of that, though, the, the final steps of formal recovery action. Yep. Could you run us through what that looks like for the ATO, actually? <laughs> Yeah, well, and that's one of the interesting things about the ATO is that they don't need to go through the full long version of recovery. They can go straight to a creditor stat demand or a bankruptcy notice if it's an individual. And the reason why they can do that is that the debt's either reported or deemed reported by them making the assessments that they have, yeah. which means that it's an undisputed debt. So they can issue a credit stat demand um, or a bankruptcy notice if it's personal without having to go through the statement of claim uh, default judgment process that they normally, that most creditors need to go through. Mm. Um, so they can, they can smack straight into that very quickly. Uh, once you get that notice, you've got 21 days to deal with it. Yep. Otherwise, you're deemed to be insolvent. Mm. So it's hard to dispute a debt where either you've told them how much you owe them or they've got the, the legal right to make an assessment. So That's the it. Yep. claim process is, here's your opportunity to tell, to prove to me that you don't owe me this money. But That's it. Yep. You can't do that with the ATO. Yeah. Now, as you said earlier, though, actually, the ATO have been very understanding and I'd say extremely supportive of Australian business. Mm. And we don't expect them to just start firing out creditors' statutory demands or garnishee notices left, right and centre. What do you expect from them in the next few months, though? Oh, look, I, I think it's like any other debt collection process. They're going to try and they're going to make calls. Uh, they're going to put the uh, move from a blue letter, as most accounts would know, saying, come on, do something, uh, to uh, I think it's an orange letter. It's not red. They changed the colour. Or okay. well, maybe their printer wasn't working properly. They'll go to the orange letter and, and put some pressure on and say, you know, we're going to go legal. Yeah. And then after that, they will have to start going legal. They'll, they'll, they'll need to start chasing it. But... Uh, and you're right, I, I don't think we're going to see this, um, you know, in three months' time, they're going to hit a button and then you're going to have a 1,000 a thousand in the court list. I think they're going to be very careful about releasing it slowly and doing it bit by bit. Mm -hmm. But regardless of what happens in the election, there's $53 billion outstanding. Um, you know, the government, on, on top of giving away 160 for JobKeeper and, and all the other money, $250, $300 billion, for us to survive, that that 50 is on top of it. Mm. And at some point, we're going to start paying those bills back and they're going to want to chase it in. Yeah, right. Mm. So the pressure is likely to come. And, and when you think about it, there's probably a backlog of liquidations right now. If you look at external administrations pre the pandemic being around 10,000 a year and during the pandemic, we're down to around 6,000 a year. Mm. Now, I know you're always a, a fan of Plan B, Ash and uh, about taking action sooner rather than later. So what I thought we'd do now is uh, maybe talk a little bit about a real-life uh, case study, uh, a client. Yeah, and I, I think just before um, um, I start to, we start asking about that, is uh, I think for everyone listening, I, I really want it to be clear that I'm actually not a doomsdayer. Like, I, I really think there's a lot of people who have done extremely well and there's a lot of people who have survived better than I ever thought people could do. Mm. But what, what I think we're really trying to say and what I'd like to sort of get across is that it, these things will start happening and, and, having, and having your clients, having an option and having plans is what's important here. They will, there will be a lot of people who survive and thrive going through this next period of time. 
mm. but there will be people who will get caught. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mentioned at the start pro bills. Um, I actually don't think those related directly to pro bill are your biggest problem. You know, it, it's if if I've what we're and already we're starting to get calls from subcontractors of subcontractors, so they're not directly employed by pro bills. But the person that they're employed by, they're now having some troubles because their cash flow is tight because of pro build. So you look like you're not affected by it, but the, the flow down impact of, I think some of the numbers are as high as 14 to $20 billion, that, uh, million dollars, sorry, not billion, million dollars that isn't being paid down to the people that work directly with pro builds. Mm. Well, that puts pressure on 50, 70 companies down below. Yep. which then puts pressure down below again. So um, I'm not a doomsday by any stretch of the imagination, but what I do want um, everyone to understand is that there are ways to protect businesses against this or use the various rules and laws around to make sure that these people survive, yeah. whatever way that looks. And I think that, that leads us into the case study, and I'm, yep. I'm going to I'm going to turn the tables on you now. No, don't like uh, that. It's about time you did some bloody answering <laughs> questions. <laughs> so we're going to talk about a client, a real life client. Just run you through how we can actually look at this, and it's a true example of a plan B, looking at it early, doing nothing, and then coming back. So, Phil, why don't you start us off with um, what what um, about tell us about this client? Oh well. We had a client called, we're going to call him David, that's not his real name, but he, he ran a small engineering company under a company structure. Now, the business was impacted um, by COVID, and the impact was that the projects that he was going to do were all delayed, like his clients put them off because of COVID. As a result, his cash flow evaporated, and his ATO debt started to build up. Now, David's accountant noticed that he had this growing tax debt, and he recognise that as a potential warning sign of a problem somewhere down the track. Now, it wasn't an immediate problem. There was no wolf at the door uh, baying for money, but the accountant looked at it and thought, this is going to be a problem at some point. Let's go and have a look at what our options are. So we met with the client a little bit over a year ago. Now, at that time, they had workshop equipment that was worth about $60,000, had about $50,000 in debtors, and they had $10,000 in stock. So the total assets of the business were 120,000. On the liability side, they had credit, trade creditors for around 40,000 and they ATO, owed the ATO 130,000. So they had $170,000 in liabilities. At that time, the, um, there was a deficit in equity. So the liabilities exceeded the assets by $50,000. And what the accountant had identified was that the tax debt of 130 exceeded the value of the assets of the business, which was only 120. So he sort of looked at that and thought, that's going to be tough, you know, uh, going forward. But David had made all of his lodgements on time. He'd reported all of his tax debt and he hadn't heard a peep out of the ATO. The company had been receiving JobKeeper payments and there was not really any pressure for David to do anything. So in those circumstances, he did what a lot of people do. Nothing. Stuck his head in the sand and just uh, carried on. Yeah, I think that uh, the important thing to note in this timeline is that was around the 2020, um, the yeah. first year yeah. of where the problems kicked in. Mm. Um, so, so if he, uh, so it was good that it was identified, but again, with no pressure, people put their head in the sand and um, and then just wait to see what happened and hope that they can trade out of it. Yeah. So what happened after that, mate? Well, what happened after that, the, the ATO rang the accountant and uh, wanted to have a little bit of a talk. Um, the ATO were not overly aggressive at all. They were talking about payment plans, but David knew that he, had, he was in trouble. If anything, his business was actually worse than it was a year ago, or a year prior, when we are in the middle of COVID. Uh, the major government support, federal government support packages had ended, and his business still had many of the same issues that it had at the height of the pandemic. Now, David was particularly concerned that if he went into a payment plan arrangement, that he wouldn't be able to maintain it, that despite his best efforts, you know, he just couldn't, couldn't cope with it. And he came to realise that that issue he had with the ATO debt was just not going to go away. So a year down the track, David's accountant uh, arranged another meeting with De Jong Reed. We sat down and had another chat. 
And at that time, his, his workshop equipment was still worth $60,000, so no change there. His debtors had gone down to 20000 because he'd collected some of them and work had dried up. And his stock was still about 10000 So now his assets were $90,000, $30,000 less uh, than it was a year before. On the creditor side, on the liability side, his creditors had gone up by $20,000 to $60,000. And the ATO debt had gone up by $60,000 up to one hundred and ninety. dollars so now the liabilities of the business are 250. So the deficit position that was 50,000 has now grown to 160,000 over that time. So the business is in a, a weaker financial position, still has all of its same, same issues that it had before that. Yeah, and, and look, I think that again, that's coming in another year down the track. And I think it's important to see that this journey is happening. And, we're seeing a lot of this at the moment where the ATO has been used as the unofficial overdraft mm -hmm. and to help a business survive. And we know, knowing David, he was doing it for all the right reasons. Yep. He's trying to keep the business alive, keep his staff in play and all that sort of thing. Well, I can just uh, say, so it's what we sometimes see is even worse is that they've not only used the ATO as a second overdraft, but sometimes they borrowed money from smaller lenders or and injected that into the business as well. So Absolutely. So other loans yeah. on the balance sheet too. So given that we're now a year, another year down the track for David, what, what are his options? What were well, his options? His options, he, he could maybe borrow some more money against his family home and inject it into the business perhaps. Mm. Um, he could enter into a payment plan with the ATO and, and hope for the best and continue to trade as normal. He could close the business down and uh, go get salaried employment or go, go get a job somewhere else. Or he could restructure the business and trade in the name of a new company. Thank you. And that's uh, options we've often talked about, isn't it? Yeah. So, uh, so, and after, after, you know, uh, after they've reviewed all that, and we, and we obviously put an updated proposal through, as we know, which was obligation and cost free to him, mm -hmm. after careful consideration and discussions with the accountant, I think David decided that he wanted to trade on the business. Yeah, yeah that's but right, actually. Uh, but obviously needed to deal with a bit of uh, the legacy issue. So yeah. can you talk us through what, what came about with that? Well, he decided that he did want to restructure the business and bring finality to the debts of the old business. And we assisted him with a business restructure. Now, Ash, I might just uh, yeah. briefly run through the process for a business restructure and I know that many of our guests today would have heard this before, but for the benefit of people that are maybe joining us for the first time, we'll just quickly run through it. Mm -hmm. So the normal process of restructuring a business is to get formal valuations on all the physical assets and the goodwill and any intellectual property that the, the business may own. Once you know what it's worth, you can then contract to sell that for full market value to a new trading entity. If the new trading entity takes over the employment of staff and becomes liable for their entitlements, the purchaser is entitled to offset those employee entitlements against the purchase price of the business. The vendor company uh, then distributes all the money that it has according to security and priority positions. As, and then after that goes into liquidation. Uh, Phil, that's a phoenix, isn't it, mate? Sure is. <laughs> Absolutely, it's a phoenix. Yeah. So, and look, I'm joking saying it to you, but we, we know that there are there is a legal way of doing it and the illegal way of doing it. So um, it, it is clearly part of the legislation now that a restructure like this can be done. Yep. Um, but it needs to be done commercially and at, and at full market value, or there is a slight clause that no one quite knows how it works or at, at a price near to that. So, and, and that's what we what we recommend and offer in, mm -hmm. in on occasions in these restructures is this legal version of the Phoenix. Mm. Um, so anyway, that, that's where you, you went a little bit off track there and talking about what the process is. Yeah. Let's uh, bring you back to David. Bring back to David. What happened in David's case. All right. So in the case of David, uh, David and his wife decided to borrow some more money against their family home. Rather than lend that money to the old business, they lent it to the new company. And when they lent that money to the new company, they took a security interest on the personal property security register to secure the, the money that they had loaned. Yep. That new entity then used that loan 
to purchase the assets and the goodwill of the existing business. They then did, that company then distributed the money that it had available. Now, in this case, all employee superannuation was paid in full. After the, the settlement had occurred for the purchase of the business, the company actually had money left over in its bank account. Now, David could have made a proportional distribution to all of the remaining creditors and given them all their fair share. But in this case, he decided to leave the money in the bank account and let the liquidator uh, take care of those creditors and make those distributions. Yep. So David, at the end of the day, he was able to he was able to keep going. Yeah, so he's able to continue the business. Um, but it, so, what were some of the downsides of delaying his decision to do that? Well, as we discussed, running through the numbers, the creditors have increased, and not all of those are going to be paid out from the monies that are available to the company. Some of those creditors will hold David's personal guarantee, so he's now going to have to deal with that. The increase in liabilities over that year also potentially uh, exposes David to an insolvent trading claim by a liquidator because the debts increase and the liquidator may well argue that the business was insolvent prior to that. Uh, as we said, the, the tax debt exceeded the, the assets of the business. So he might be getting a claim from a liquidator about insolvent trading. And with the ATO calling, he's now got a bit less time available to protect his personal assets and put his plan in place. I think it's really important to mention at this point too that uh, some, some of the listeners would remember that there was a monitorium on insolvent trading um, in the first year of COVID, so in 2020. That expired on the 31st of December. So there, there are certainly some businesses who uh, increased their debt position in that first year. Yep. Um, and then some that have been relatively stable but haven't been able to deal with the debt from the first year. Um, insolvent trading is a whole lecture on its own, and I'm not, I'm not going to go into that, but they're, they're, that protection exists for that year or for that nine months that it was there, but any further growth in the debt is, is, is exposed, as you mentioned. So yep. Doing it now is actually often quite better because we're actually not as big a jump in the exposure of the debt or some of the old debts now being paid because everyone's trying to do it and you're dealing with new debt, which then can have the impact on insolvent trading. So, True. again, another reason to do things earlier rather than and leave it till the last second. Yeah. So, um, so that's, that's excellent and gives a, a really brief... Um, and, and for those... Some of you might recognise the numbers and the story because it was in our uh, email uh, uh, email blast that we did uh, once a month on our case studies. So if you want to look at the numbers and look at some of the story that's actually, we've got the written version of that case study is already uh, out in the ether world or give Phil and I a call and we can come back to it sure. uh, and send it out to you again if you want to have a look at it in a bit more detail. So Phil, apart from um, uh, all of those things, did you have any other thoughts or comments that you wanted to make in regard to the, that case study? Yeah, I just say that David's still going to get a good outcome because he decided to act when the phone rang from the ATO. He could have done what a lot of people do when they get that phone call, which is nothing. He could have waited for the ATO to progress their recovery action against him. He could have waited until he got a director's penalty notice. Some people even wait until they get a creditor's accessory demand uh, <laughs> from the ATO. And all I'd say is that while it's never too late to get advice and that if you get advice, you can improve the outcome, the earlier that you act, uh, the more likely that that's going to be a good outcome or a better outcome for you. Thank you, Phil. So that's yeah, really I, all I had to say on that. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah, look, and I think it's... Um, uh, we'll wrap that up now. So if anyone does have any questions, they can start putting them into the chat box and we'll open up the room uh, or open it up for anyone to have a chat shortly. Uh, but just to round things out, again, I, I want to be really clear to everyone listening. Um, I'm, I'm not a... Uh, and smack already the feedback forms up there, so uh, do that while we go. Um, but the uh, I, I really want everyone to understand that I don't, I'm not a doomsdayer. I, I do think uh, that there are a lot of good options to keep very good family businesses alive and going well. Um, and it's important that people are aware that there are options there. So when when you're when you see a client who's been you know whether it be the ATO or state revenue or any source, 
there's there there are opportunities to ensure that those businesses are protected. Um, or you know, we, we're seeing a lot of people who are still saying enough is enough. I, I want to get out, and getting out the right way is critical. So um, uh, so that pretty much wraps us up for today. If uh, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to type them or to put your hand up, um, and we'll uh, we'll deal with any questions that anyone may have. Uh, looks like we've either done too good a job or uh, or, or um, there's nothing more to go through, uh, or they're busy working through the feedback survey, Phil, so it's, uh, can't concentrate. If they're like me, there's no way I could actually do a question and, um, and, and do the survey at the same time. <laughs> uh, but it's interesting times, Ash, and I think uh, those phones are going to start ringing. And as you said earlier, there's no fee and there's no obligation to just understand what your options are. And uh, I think for those uh, around the country at different times over the next period, uh, it, it's with great delight that I get to say that we are going back to doing some in-person functions. And, uh, and uh, over the next month, you'll start seeing some invites go out for our breakfast seminars again. Um, and we're very excited about starting to run those across the country. So uh, please keep your eye out in your inbox for those. Uh, we will still be running the webinar. So for those who prefer the online and the pleasure of sitting on their couch or at the desk and uh, listening to Phil and I, then we'll still be doing the webinars um, and, and, uh, and continuing that process. Uh, but now that uh, the world's starting to get to a, back to a little bit of normality, um, we will also be doing the in-person ones. Yeah. And for those who love uh, the rugby leagues and the AFLs and we're, we're, by, by this time we get back, Phil, next month, the seasons will be up and running. I think the, first, the NRL starts tonight. Kicks off tonight, yep. And AFL starts next week. So uh, uh, they're trying to go for a record uh, number of uh, uh, people or bums on seats for the AFL this year for the first round. I think I've got 420 or 425,000 people they need to get to break the record. So... Uh, doesn't look like we've got any questions, so we're just rambling for no value now. All right. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. Ash, you and I do that all the time, mate. Oh, uh, that's true. That's true. All right. All right. Well, uh, we'll leave everyone to it. Thank you all for your Thank attendance. You. It's been great to have you along. Hopefully, you've got something out of it. And as I always say, please feel free to ring um, your strategists uh, or Phil or I and um, ask any questions or, or run any scenarios that you have by... Uh, by us, yep. um, and of course that includes Hank. Don't uh, don't think he's not included in someone you can give a call if you need to. So yeah, really uh, thank you all. <laughs> Have a wonderful day, and we'll uh, we'll thank talk you. to you all again. We'll see you all again next month. Bye bye. Bye.